Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend, Mr. Anthony Amadeo. Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Bart. This is awesome, man. Yes. So this is a, a really interesting one because uh, we're talking about Covington era Rogers drums, mm -hmm. and this is a kind of a first of its kind where I saw you do uh, a really unbelievable presentation at the um, Shields Classic Rogers drum show that Poe Shy puts on in mm -hmm. uh, Covington, Ohio, about an hour away from me, which was awesome. But oh, cool. You did a presentation on this. It's interesting because it was a bunch of drum nerds sitting in like a, I don't want to say, a ca I guess it's a cafeteria. Yeah, a cafeteria of, it was. Of a high school, but you had the TV going with like, you know, with clips and everything that you presented there today, we will see. But mm -hmm. it was really special to have like Rob Cook and Bernie Stone and all these just drum legends sitting there hanging on every word you're saying. Uh, you did unbelievable. That was that. amazing. So, Congrats. Thank you for yes. thank you for saying that. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Yeah. So obviously, though, it was a pretty much instant thought of like, wow, Anthony needs to come and do his presentation on the podcast because you are. We're going to learn all this very soon, but you are scientific with this. Like you are doing <laughs> some serious research on on it, Rogers. Yeah, it's a it's a passion that burns inside of me. So I just I kind of have no choice. It runs me, you know. <laughs> Yeah, Truly. Anthony, uh, let's start off, man. You have the presentation. I'll chime in every once in a while. But I think for okay. starters, just the first thing to maybe start with is tell us about Covington era and Rogers and how it all works together. OK, yeah. Since we're going to be geeking out on on Covington Rogers stuff, I think it'd be cool to clarify what the Covington era actually is, which would be yep. in 1954 when drums actually started coming out of the plant to the summer of 1968. Rogers drums were built on Joe Thompson's property in Covington, Ohio. And and that's the Covington era and the, and the era that I'm obsessed with. Yeah. yeah. So. Very well put. Let's also say to people that there is an episode of the podcast with Jeff Burke and Poe Shy that covers like a more broad, mm -hmm. you know, Rogers history, which yeah. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, that'll tell you all about the different because Rogers um, is a very, very old company. It goes yeah. back to what the 18 isn't it is it not one of the earliest drum companies well they it way back in the new jersey era they were really just a, a hide head company they were mostly focusing on drum heads and banjo heads and things like that and and later on in the 30s and 40s they started to make some drums but it wasn't until covington that they became one of the heavy hitters in the in the drum industry you know oh that's interesting that ties right into this so um yeah anyway everyone else check that episode out for more of like broad rogers history but yeah um, great stuff in that one yeah those guys are awesome and thank you to poe you'll hear later in the episode he he reached out and walked outside with us and said he, he's like he he absolutely wanted to sponsor this episode with poe's percussion so you'll hear an ad later for the for poe but all right, Anthony, give us the presentation, my friend. I'm excited to hear it again. Uh, well, I don't know if I could just uh, talk about the origins of the Rogers obsession first. Yes, or, please. Or, so like uh, the origins of my Rogers obsession starts with always just always loving vintage drums. And the you know the first set I ever owned in 1979 was a 65 Slingerland, a set that I still have. And that kind of set the bar for me. Modern drums really never did it. And I always loved Rogers and other brands as well. But um, at about 2015, I got fed up with rail consulates. Like specifically, that was it. Yeah. So so I started to just really sell all that stuff and buy a bunch of Rogers and obsessed over it, sort of examining it and what made it awesome. And then in 2019, there was that first Covington show that Poe put on. And that's when I got completely obsessed with the history and it was really first just seeing the town, which is basically yeah. Mayberry, you know, yeah. a, a village in Miami Valley, Ohio, with a population of like 2,500. Yeah. And it made me think of these small town people in basically a homemade factory building drums for Buddy Rich and Louis Belson. And these and how these townspeople took so much pride in what was coming out of their small town. On my YouTube channel, I have a lot of interviews with former employees and one of them is dan davis and well dan at the factory would drill out the shells and cut the bearing edges and stuff and um he later became a, a plant foreman and we were talking about building drums for louis and stuff and he said to me it didn't matter if it was 
built for the guy next door, he got the same treatment that Louis Belson got. And to me, that kind of encapsulates the entirety of the era. You know, when when yeah. Rodgers was building the best drums in the world, in my opinion. And I, I, I was funny. I was talking the other day to my my friend, Steve Bedalament, who is the president of uh, Innovation Drum Company. And he knew Bill Ludwig II really well. And he said that one day he was over at Bill Ludwig's house and they were talking about Rodgers. And Bill had said to him, you know, from 64 to 68, as far as overall quality, Rogers was really kicking our ass. Well, and I, yeah. And that's that's yeah. just it's, it seems kind of funny to hear from Bill. And and that kind of quality trickled down from the top, from Henry Grossman, from Joe Thompson, from Ben Strauss, trickled down to the employees, that pride. And um and at that yeah. two nine, 2019 show, getting to meet some of these employees and hear their stories of what happened back then, it ignited something in me that just burns hot all the time you know it, yeah and and at that 2019 show was also when i met a guy named dave sims and dave sims is the pioneer of rogers research he blazed the trail there's no trail before dave and he hmm. said that in in the early 90s when he was collecting drums he noticed there was a lot of literature and stuff out there on gretch on ludwig on slingerland but there was really nothing on rogers and um him living about 30 minutes or 30 miles outside of Covington, he said, like, you know, I'm gonna write my own book, even if it's just on the Covington era. So he said that one day when he got off work, the third shift at 7 a.m., he just drove down to Covington, pulled into the hardware store, and spoke to the first person he saw in there who was just a woman behind the counter and said, can anyone tell me about the Rogers drums that used to be built in this town? And the woman he was speaking to happened to be a woman named Brenda Beeman, who lived at the bottom of the hill on Joe Thompson's property where the plant was. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, small town stuff, right? I yeah, mean, really. Yeah. So she was able to give him some phone numbers. And through those phone numbers, he got more phone numbers. And before he knew it, he was sitting at these people's houses, former employees, learning about what went on in the Covington era and recording it all on cassette tape. And I have those cassette tapes now. Dave has passed a lot of his research on to me. And, uh, I've, I've digitized a lot of those and put them up on my YouTube channel. And they're just full of amazing information hearing from these people who are no longer with us. Most of them. Yeah. And so he was doing this for about four years, Dave Sims. And he said he was about 80% of the way through his research when he saw an ad that Rob Cook put out that said, I'm writing a Rogers book. Does anybody have any information? So he's like, here's my chance, you know, cause Rob has all the connections and yes. the where, yeah. the way, you know, to, he's got all these books out. So he passed it on to Rob and what we see in that Rob cookbook, it wouldn't have been the same without Dave all that Covington information is, is Dave Sims information. Yeah. Um, so I kind of see myself as standing on the shoulders of Dave picking up where he left off. I feel like my research is less about like, you know, Henry Grossman purchasing in 1952 from Cleveland Rogers and moving it from New Jersey to Ohio or, how CBS promised they wouldn't pull the rug out from the people of Covington and they did sure. or how or like how the leading name was almost purchased instead of Rogers. Do you know do you know that story? That's a that's a pretty interesting one. No, uh, may, maybe we I, it's come up at the show or hearing about that at the Rogers show. But no, I'd love to hear well, if that. We could, if we could go off really quickly from the yeah, 19, from the 1920s, Henry Grossman uh, had a, a wholesale music distribution company a music instrument distribution company called uh grossman music corporation and they would put out these huge counter catalogs wow where, where they would sell everything you can imagine in, in as far as musical instruments sure and um in the early 1950s they were looking for a, a drum name to sell through through their catalog and um, I guess Bill Ludwig had just bought his name back from CG Khan and Leedy was available. And Ben Strauss was like, Leedy's a respected name. We should buy Leedy. And they almost bought Leedy. But Henry Grossman got wind that there was one descendant of the Rogers family still alive, a guy named Cleveland Rogers, whose health was failing and he was looking to get out of the business. So I think Henry Grossman got a good deal on the Rogers name. Oh, man. And that's how, you know, he bought it and he found the New Jersey factory in shambles and was like, we got to move this to Ohio. <laughs> yeah. And that's when Joe Thompson Crazy. got involved and they built the factory on his property. And that's when it became, you know, the superpower that it sort of became for that short period of time.
Wow. So, what could have been? Because at right. one point, Leedy was like the largest manufacturer. They had the largest drum factory in the world yeah, or something like all that. all of that stuff. And, I, and George Way was involved with them. Yes, and there was all yeah. kinds of heavy duty stuff going on. So, yeah. Um, but Fascinating. You know, but my, my research is more about the gear, the shells, the components built out on the shells yeah. and things like that. And um, also the vendors, which I always find really interesting. Like, where did all the metal stuff come from? That's kind of like where my head goes. Because a lot of it was made in-house or sourced quite locally the way, you know, old companies would do. Like, for example, the chrome plating was done at a place called Miami Valley Platers in Piqua, which is a small town very close to Covington. Um, the lugs were both made in-house. The drawn brass bread and butter lugs were made in-house. And then the cast lugs were made at a place called Acrocast in Dayton. Uh, the square head tension rods uh, came from National Screw and Manufacturing Company in Cleveland. And I think I sent you that purchase order over, which is a really cool piece from 1965, where they ordered 300,000 one and a half inch square head tension rods to be shipped to them in increments of 100,000. And I think it was October, November and December. So that kind of tells you how much the company was growing at that time in 65. Yeah. yeah. And, and and also uh, that purchase order is signed by a man named Ray Mantell, who I also sent a picture of because I always love to put a face to a name. The aluminum parts, like pieces of the bass drum pedal and the hi-hat pedal came from Ross Alumini Foundry in Sydney, Ohio. And the brass shells were rolled at Dayton Metal Spinning in Trotwood, Ohio. So a lot of this stuff was coming from surrounding towns and surrounding cities, the way yeah. old companies did back then. And um, as an Ohio guy, I like hearing, I mean, Dayton yeah. is like, four, I could be a Dayton in like 40 minutes. And like I said, Covington is an hour away. It's neat to hear this stuff happening right For here sure. in you know, Ohio. Well, from what I understand, not being from there, there was a lot of industry in Dayton. Yes. Yeah. As far as I know. But it, it is funny because Cincinnati and Dayton, I mean, they're different cities. They're close, but I don't know much about the details, but there are a lot of uh, it definitely an industrial town. In yeah. Dayton. yeah. 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 A lot of a lot of stuff for Rogers was coming out of there. And as we know, we eventually ended up they eventually ended up there in the CBS yeah. era. But um, well, the other stuff that was not quite as local, like wrap suppliers and shell manufacturers, or early stands came from Walberg and Auger in, in Massachusetts. Those early stands are just just awesome pieces. But the wraps came from places like Roland Technologies in Berlin, Connecticut, which is now a company called Aurafall, apparently. And they're known for something called Rolux Illusion Film and something called Moire, which is in the drum world known as Satin Flame, which is pretty cool. Yeah, um, very cool. Then there was DuPont out of Delaware. And then by 1966, Delmar had kind of like cornered the industry and taken over. And I think yeah. I'm pretty sure Rogers used Delmar from there on out that makes uh, as, sense, far as, but as far as raps. That's cool to put that into perspective because you can't be all in Ohio, but it's neat. I mean, it sounds like for the most part, though, it was pretty USA oh, uh, yeah. centric. Obviously, that time was different than today where a lot of things are in, in Taiwan and things like that. But right. Uh, very cool. Very high quality. And and I'm not sure if you said it originally, but Covington era 54 to 68 yes. which gives people that that perspective. And also about what you said with uh, William F. Ludwig, the second would be 64 to 68. That's Ringo, Boom, yeah. Beatles. Ed Sullivan quality goes slightly down, I guess one would think. And we've uh, heard of, we've we've all heard about the three shifts and yes, we know that just get the drums out. Week. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. because of that, though, the quality. Uh, so for WFL two to say that is pretty high praise for sure. You know? For yeah. sure. That's yeah. that's specifically why I mentioned it, because coming yeah. from a guy like that, you know, to to say that about a competitor, you know, it's pretty crazy. Absolutely. There's the topic of shell suppliers, and I have some notes over here to keep me on track because I'm kind of the king of tangents. Sure. So uh, if we could briefly talk about some of the companies who supplied these shells, because there are some conflicting theories out there on who supplied what and when and what kind of wood they were, et cetera, et cetera. The earliest company to supply shells to Rogers was um, Jasper Wood Products out of um, out of Indiana. And... Um, and that's not to say that early on in the cut in the Grossman era, there wasn't another shell supplier, but the first company to supply bulk delivery to Rogers was uh, was Jasper. And according to Ben Strauss, they supplied a very nice product, 
But Rogers eventually started to have trouble getting enough shells to fill growing orders. And I mm. sent over a clip of Ben Strauss talking about this very thing with uh, a man named Mark Garris. Which we will listen to right now. And I'm going to say real quick, Ben Strauss, artist relations and marketing manager from 53 to 76. So let's check that out. Now, when we first started out, okay. we used to buy our shells from Jasper in Indiana. Oh. But we always had difficulty yeah. getting delivery. Couldn't get enough delivery uh -huh. as we started to grow. They, okay. so the old story, when you first start out, you buy very sparingly. Everything is fine. The minute you start to improve your sales and you need more, then your suppliers have to keep up with you or you're in trouble. Right. In Jasper, Jasper, Indiana. In Indiana. And we were very happy with the uh, um, grade of merchandise they were giving us. The product was great, but Unfortunately, like I told you, we couldn't get enough supply. Oh. So we start looking around, and finally, uh, I just to he hit on the killer, who at that time was an unknown right. as far as the drum business. Now, where concerned. were they from? They're up in I New England know. states. Sure. I think in New Hampshire. Hey guys, this episode is brought to you by my friend Poe Shy of Poe's Percussion. Um, as I mentioned in this episode, Poe is the gentleman who puts on the Shields classic drum show, which is just all Covington era Rogers drums in Covington, Ohio. I was just there. I had an amazing time. I hope everyone checks it out. But Poe is also a buyer and seller of all things Rogers Covington era, which ranges from 1954 to 1968. So if you are looking to buy some Rogers Covington era drums, he's the man to talk to. Or if you have some Covington era drums that you'd like to sell, Poe is who you'd want to do that with because he's fair, he's extremely nice, and uh, he's very knowledgeable and will likely know what you have and put a fair value on it for you and sells at a, at a fair price as well. So uh, to learn more, go to Poe's Percussion on Facebook. Just search it there and you'll find it. Also on Instagram, you can find Poe's Percussion, P-O-S Percussion, Poe's Percussion. Um, and if you're going to be at the Chicago Drum Show, which is coming up very soon after this episode is being released... 2023 you can find him uh at the chicago drum show booth 99 and 100 huge thank you to poe shy of poe's percussion for sponsoring this episode and uh he's he's a great guy reach out to him if you're interested in covington era rogers drums so thank you poe for sponsoring this episode all right and then um there's a photo you have of henry grossman in his bow tie uh with joe thompson at the factory and three workers standing on one of their perma built shells in the 1950s uh, permabilt ref referring to the staggered butt joint engineering, which which gave the shell great strength, which I'll go over in more detail in just a bit. But this is how they advertised their shell construction with this famous photo or versions of it. A lot of them were in the catalogs. These guys standing on the shell. That was like a, a pretty thing. cool. Yeah, yeah, it is. It shows the strength. <laughs> you got three guys standing on your shell. And uh, would there ever be like consideration to like, you know, because some some people did, some people didn't like build their own shells in house or anything like that I, or with Rogers? I yeah. don't I don't I don't I don't know of any consideration of that. But I, I, I will mention something coming up pretty soon about them getting shells from Slingerland occasionally who did manufacture their, their own their shells. Own. Sure, sure. Interesting. Um, OK. But uh, according to Ben Strauss, uh, Roger's supplier at the time did not have the forms or tooling to make a shell larger than 22 inches. And we all know that some of the drummers on the Rogers roster, namely Louis Belson and Buddy Rich, there's those names again, like to play a 24. Um, and for shells of those sizes, like I just mentioned, they had to source from Slingerland, uh, you know, to get those sizes and for larger marching and concert bass drums, they would source them from Slingerland. And I had recently found out that uh, Slingerland had supplied during this era, not only Rogers, but some some other companies, uh, namely other people who use Jasper, such as Camco and others, would get, get a, a shell here and there supplied from Slingerland. And um, Ben Strauss tells the story of having to convince Buddy Rich that he didn't need more than a 22 inch bass drum to play behind a sextet, you know, and Buddy bought it, not knowing that Ben was only saying this because his supplier didn't make a shell bigger, you know, pretty, Love it. pretty yeah. shrewd businessman, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need that in the back <laughs> of his mind. He's like, please, God, don't get that shell. We can't make it. Right. And then there's the, um, there's a, a, a clip of Ben Strauss talking about that very thing. We were able 
to get shells up yeah. to certain sizes oh, they had never I'm made. Just, and when I'm it came so to good. making a large concert bass drum, we were out of luck. So out. believe it or not, we would buy a shell from so Sunder. I, I thought maybe you were and going to refinish it to oh, our right. satisfaction and make a concert drum. We may have never sold a lot of large concert drums. At that you time, know, like the, the biggest bass drum we yeah. had was a 14 by 22. Alley, we know. got them to make oh, larger see. forms than that. When we first got yeah. together with it's Buddy, Alley, Buddy was always That's using it. a 14 by 24, as was Louis Belson. Uh -huh. yeah, you don't and need we convinced and, him that they uh, should be satisfied uh, with a 22. Buddy said, always use a 24. I said, yeah, but you're working with a sextet. You don't need a 24-inch bass drum. Why don't you let me set you up with a 22 and everything will be fine. And he went along with it. And uh, then we made the 24s for Buddy, uh, for Louie also. And then you also have a, a picture that I sent you of Buddy playing one of those 22s. Very rare to see a picture of Buddy Rich playing a 22-inch bass drum. And it's a great shot of a beautiful set with the yeah. bread and butter lugs. I love that shot. Yeah, to, to describe it for people listening, it's like a beautiful... I mean, the white marine pearl with a canister thrown, mm -hmm. Buddy... Kind of hunched over, of as we can ex you know, as we're all used to, but with a 22 and it's, this is just in general, whatever size bass drum, there's a lot of, I love side yeah. shots of, buttons. I was just going to say, it's that side shot. You get that open left-handed side shot where you could see everything going on. Yes. Very cool. Um, so around 64, 65, when business really started to pick up, Rogers had to look for a shell supplier who could keep up with these demanding orders. As we saw in that purchase order, they're ordering 300,000 uh, tension rods so you know things were picking up and i think this is what this is when they landed with keller um there's a highly published theory that rogers used jasper three ply shells until 61 when they changed to keller three ply shells and then in 65 the keller three ply shells turned to change to keller five ply shells and that 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 theory always seemed pretty flimsy to me and quite frankly just not very logical so i i was just driven to dive deeper and I've long had a theory that Rogers was never really exclusive with a shell manufacturer and used both Jasper and Keller simultaneously for periods of time. And I stumbled across this 1966 article called Rogers Steps Up Business Beat, where there's an interesting statement. And I sent you that, that article. Maple shells ranging from 12 to 40 inches in diameter come to the plant from Indiana and New Hampshire. Now, does this back up my theory? Maybe. I don't know, but it's just New Hampshire would be Keller. Would be, Indiana would be Jasper. exactly. Yep. So I don't know if this backs up my theory, but it is cool to see it mentioned. The, the yeah, two places I mean, as an like as someone who you're really deep into this stuff as someone on the outside, I would say, yeah, that pretty much. <laughs> but you also have to think that like if it's if it's in the you know, whatever, if this is the newspaper or whatever, they're not like they might be a little loosey goosey totally. with facts here and totally. there, but that is definitely an aha moment. It is. Right I now. mean, and when you're digging for stuff like I am, that's definitely an aha moment for me. I'm like, yeah, okay, both places. <laughs> yes. Does it prove my theory? No. Does it make me excited? Yes. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Um, but as I continue to dig, I found that coincidentally and simultaneously, my friend and associate, Rick Giles, uh, was on the very same quest. And we began to kind of collaborate and share notes because Rick had sat with some former employees of Jasper and gathered some really priceless information and i believe what we found yep. is is pretty close to the truth of how it all actually went down as far as shell manufacturers um what was obvious to me is that the re-rings and the edges that changed in 1961 and i sent you a side-by-side -side shot where you see the the wide re-rings the earlier wide re-rings on the left and then the other re the more uh modern re-rings on the right that change in 61 from the flat wide bottom re-rings with the rounded edges to the double angled re-rings with the sharp edges is what led people to believe i think that the manufacturer had changed but to me this router change had more to do with rogers changing their bearing edge than actually changing a supplier they changed to a double 45 degree sharper edge in 61 and i think that led people to believe hey the manufacturer had changed there are just too many things pointing to all three ply shells being Jasper. And if we can, I'd like to go over some of those. Yep. Um, a short side note, though, a short one, I promise. Sure. I have seen very few six ply Jasper shell Rogers drums, which is kind of not surprising because at the time Jasper was 
supplying Gretsch with six ply shells. They look exactly like a Gretsch shell, just with a three ply re ring installed, which is really interesting to me. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to get some testing done on one of, the, one of those shells to see if it was actually the shell composition that, um, that Gretsch was using, which I believe was maple gum. Somebody could correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I think it was maple gum that Jasper was, was using in the Gretsch shells. It might be a little tough to get uh, one of those six ply uh, Rogers shells because they're, they're pretty rare and you kind of have to destroy a shell to get a sample. Yeah, you're yeah, that's a whole nother side note, which like at the end, we have to talk about your sampling and your things like that, because right. I know it'll derail us yeah. kind of now. Yeah. But like but you are really like I said in at the beginning, you're doing some scientific stuff here and, and testing the wood and all that. Good We're stuff. trying to. And it is difficult because you either have to drill the shell or the shell has to be completely damaged in some way in a car accident or something, you know, but. So, but it's a great way to get life out of a busted up shell totally. that's there's nothing else happening with it except it being thrown away. Absolutely. It is the perfect way to yeah, to get keep it alive. To get yeah, to get use out of something useless for sure. Yes, um, yes, yeah. So so back to three ply shells. First I want to talk about these letters that we find literally stamped into the re-rings of the shells. And I, I sent you an example of one of them. And and in that particular picture it's an F, but sometimes it's an A. Sometimes it's been it's an M or a W, depending on which way you're holding the shell. Uh, we believe that these stamps are some sort of quality control mark from the Jasper factory. This wasn't something done by Keller. I know that. And we know for sure it didn't happen in Covington. Collectively, we've spoken to enough employ employees there to know that it's not something that happened in-house. And many, many see an F and immediately think Frank Walters. Frank was one of the most well-known assemblers at the Covington plant. And certain assemblers would write their initial on the inside tag as sort of a maker's mark when they assembled the drum and sure. Frank would always write an F. But we know for a fact that these drums would get their lacquered interior before assembly, of course, and all of these stamps are under the lacquer. This wasn't something that was yeah. done by an assembler. And these stamps disappear right around 65 or so. And that, that's going to be an important date going, going through the what we're talking about here. So Jasper was stamped with the letter as a sign of this has gone through quality. And, you know, this might be a, a dumb thing to say, but I I would have thought so. So was Jasper applying the re rings before being sent? Yeah, that would have been done on the pre. OK, because I didn't know why I thought it would be. Here's some re rings and you hammer them in and you whatever. And it's spacers and things. From, but so they'd get them and they would do the edge. from from what I've gathered from everyone who worked there from both Jasper and Keller, the shells would come with re rings in them and then they would cut mostly Dan Davis, who I spoke about before, would would cut the edges. Yeah. Like I said, these those stamps disappear right around 65 or so. There's that date. Also, almost every Jasper shell that I own and have seen have these little gaps where the plies meet, visible at the edge. I sent over a side-by-side -side picture of the both three-ply rounded edge and sharp edge where you could see these little, these little gaps. I only see this on three-ply shells and never on never on the five ply shells. This would be the staggered butt joint uh, of the aforementioned permabuilt technology that I was speaking about before. These built shells were built as extra rigid based on this technology. Um, what was built as a permabuilt shell, as I just said, were the staggered butt joints, meaning that every ply joint is at a different spot on the shell. So say on a five ply shell, at every joint, there's four plies of solid material surrounding it. As opposed to say, gotcha. as opposed to say, like a scarf joint where all the ends meet at one spot, like the shells that Slingerlin and Ludwig made, where the pearl laminate was joined into the scarf joint. T to do that, they used something called a, a Foot Brothers bending mandrel. It's a very old process where everything would meet at the scarf joint, and um, this well, this, this staggered butt joint process is something that's pretty common today. And, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm clearly yeah. I'm clearly no shell expert. You're more than me. And it's, <laughs> it's fascinating to get this info from someone like you. And, and, and there was always that pursuit to have shells that would not go out of round exactly. and the ins the insurance policy of like the re ring to keep it solid. But I mean, if you've already got three grown men standing on top of a <laughs> shell, you're pushing, you know, it's working yeah. really clearly. Yeah. Um, great. Yeah. Adver great advertising, if nothing else. I mean, <laughs> yeah, really. You, and, you don't need to do that, but <laughs> right. And I, I mean, I'm 
obviously, like I said, I'm no shell expert. I thank Bernie Stone for fielding all my questions because I bother him quite a bit. And he, oh, that's he, awesome. he, 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 he comes up quite often in this. Um, but that yeah. Permabil technology was used by Rogers on both their Jasper and Keller shells, but only the three ply shells have these gaps. And again, these gaps disappear right around 65. There's that, there's that year again. And while doing some research, I contacted a representative at Keller Shells, and during our conversation, he mentioned a few things that at the time I had kind of written off, but later became important. And I'm glad I recorded the conversation so I could go back and check. And when I asked him when Keller started supplying Rogers with shells, he said that had to be right around 65 when the company was finally ready to go commercial. Rogers was among the first to take us on commercially. And myself, still firmly believing the old theory of changing to Keller in 61, I kind of thought maybe he wasn't remembering correctly or was misinformed, you know? Uh, and, yeah. and then when I asked him about how many plies those shells might have been, he said, without hesitating, he said, those shells would, we, we supplied to Rogers were always five ply as per their requested specs with butt joint shells and scarf joint re-rings. And via Rick, wow. G Rick Giles, who I mentioned before, who had spoken to the plant manager, manager at Jasper, uh, he told him that their default method was for shells to have staggered butt joint re-rings. If we could look at that F stamp photo again, you could clearly see a butt joint re-ring. And on all three ply shells that I've seen, there's prominent butt joint re-rings. Again, I wrote it off as him possibly not remembering properly. And I asked if he would know what the wood composition of those shells would be. He stated, those would have been maple shells with maple re-rings. For a third time, there's me respectfully kind of like, maybe he doesn't have <laughs> yeah. the info. But after yeah. doing the research that I mentioned, the water started to clear a bit. And everything he was saying was right on the money. Everything. As, as my friend Jerry Shields, who was a Covington employee, once told me, and I quote, right around 64, 65, Rogers started to get very busy. This had to be when Jasper was having trouble filling orders and Rogers had yep. to look elsewhere for supply. In my mind, enter the five ply Keller shell. It's just like it's it's just the dots. It's too perfect. The dots yeah. are connecting, you know? Yeah. I personally believe the re-ring and bearing edge change of 61 was in direct cor correlation with the inception of the Dynasonic snare drum and their search for a snappier, more responsive drum and and nothing more. It was just a, just a change in the re-ring. So just to like kind of super duper back up and clarify. So then Keller wouldn't have been involved at all before 65. And that was the start of it. As, as far as, as far as I'm know. concerned, and as far as what I was told by this representative at Keller and, and what, what the puzzle pieces are putting together, it just, it really looks like that to me completely. Yeah. Like, compl like Keller clear as a bell. Been just doing furniture or something before that and not well, they, making drum I, shells. I know, and, I know they were like making um like banjo bodies and stuff like that oh, okay. i actually that i actually sense. learned a lot of this from your episode with justin yeah, with, owen yeah who's i love that episode <laughs> and i love defending keller whenever it comes up Great. in a chance to like I, when people say something bad i've yeah. studied that episode and he actually says this stuff right in that episode um cool but jasper is kind of more of a mystery simply Got because it, yeah. there aren't as many kept records or people still living to you know, who know the details of the operation. We do know that JWP pioneered curved wood plywood using dielectric heat to cure glue lines, which I'm sure was a game changer at the time, but I'm not going to pretend that I knew what that meant at all when I learned about what it was. Yeah. So I actually yeah. text Bernie Stone, who replied with an extremely long text, which I'm not going to read because <laughs> he went into yeah. crazy detail about temperatures and rf percent processes and all that stuff yeah but the very yeah. but the very first sentence he says dielectric means the mold or platens are always hot sort of like a george foreman grill would be the burners uh. are, the burners on an electric stove are dielectric coils so that kind of i, I get that it. simplifies yeah it. <laughs> yeah I george picture, foreman grill i get george it. Yeah. Foreman <laughs> grill that fits a, a drum shell i got it yeah um, perfect <laughs> it, it's it's also stated that the glue that Jasper used to adhere the plies was infused with a red aniline dye, or some people say it was a red metal flake. And I've always thought that mm. if we could get between those plies to get a look at the glue, we can get some more answers. And I guess uh, the 
the employees at Jasper said that they did that just for identif- you know, to identify purposes. So someone could be like, oh, that's if you want to know that's our product, get between it if you see the red glue, you know. Interesting. Which, which is which is interesting. Um Yeah, yeah. There like we were saying before, there was some mention at some publications that Jasper shipped their shells to Rogers in tubes and that Rogers would receive the tubes, cut them in the shells, and install the re-rings. But Everyone that I've spoken to who worked for Rogers had told me that this is false and that they, mm. they showed up as shells with re-rings in them. To me, that's another debunked theory, respectfully. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's it keeps you on your toes because if you hear something, you know this to not just accept it as blind. Yeah. Like that's the, yeah, they, they, they must, because people do remember incorrectly and that's yeah. totally human and normal. So right. you don't take anything. I mean, I feel like everything you state is like, uh, vetted, which is great. Totally. I'm taking information from all angles and kind of, I'm just trying to piece a puzzle together. I don't have all the answers. This isn't like definitively what the answers are. It's, it's a puzzle that I'm eternally putting together. Like we know that Jasper was an early shell supplier, as mentioned before, before, you know, before Keller, obviously, but what we learned pretty recently from that former employee at Jasper was that Jasper was supplying Rogers with shells into the 1970s. So more evidence of Rogers not being exclusive with a shell supplier, especially in the CBS era. Now, I don't know if we should maybe explain what the CBS era is, what I mean by that. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, but you're the man to do it. So yeah, please do. It gets a little bit confusing because there's some overlap. In April of 1966, CBS, uh, Columbia Broadcasting System or Service or whatever. Yeah, yeah. The um, big CBS. The big CBS. The one you you think of when you hear CBS. Bought rogers from henry grossman and um but they left production or assembly in covington until the summer of 68 so there's some overlap in the covington era and cbs um so from 66 to 68 drums were still assembled in covington and then they moved assembly for a very short period of time to dayton and then off to fullerton they went And I'm in agreement with some of the employees of Covington that I spoke with who think um, that CBS's intention all along was to get the company to Fullerton, California, because they had recently bought Fender and they had Fender in a plant in Fullerton and they wanted to get Rogers in the same plant, which they eventually did. But they had to kind of get the company out of the grips of the people of Covington. I mean, the plant was on Joe Thompson's property. The man lived and breathed. Yeah, engineering things for Rogers drums. So they had to kind of get it out of the grips of the people of Covington, move it just to hop and a skip to Dayton for a little while. And then off to Fullerton, they went. And that to me, this is my own personal opinion. That's where the kind of downfall of Rogers started to happen. Um, Too corporate. Because it's like you said, he's living there. And it's it is truly sad with a small town like that to lose. I'm not I don't think they employed everyone in the town, but it's you should lose any industry. is bad. I mean, it was think about what that probably did for the economy of the town and those people, all those yeah. jobs, you know? Yeah. And they took so much pride in that, that those drums were coming out of their small town to lose that. To, and I've heard, I've spoken to, to some of them employees about it. it. It broke, it broke a lot of their hearts, man. It really did. Of course. Yeah, it really did. But I digress. That was a little digression. Um, no, I love it. Yeah. Uh, that former employee of Jasper, who I was talking about, offer, who offered the information on the 70s shows, he mentioned that these shells would have either a maple or birch outer ply. Now, I've pulled up many quite long discussions from up to 20 years ago on drum forums, including some pretty prominent names in the vintage drum world, where most were claiming they found birch or were told birch was part of the Rogers shell composition. One person who's a prominent figure in the vintage drum community even claims that he was told this by the president of Keller. And I believe these discussions are where the theory of birch in the shell composition became involved as if it was in all Rogers shells, which which it absolutely isn't. Um, In the months leading up to the the Shields Classic Drum Show in Covington, which you were at and where I met you, myself, Poe Shy, Jeff Burke, and Rick Giles uh, set out to place some definitive evidence on the topic of shell composition and simply just start to find some truth. And we've employed uh, the laboratory of Harry Alden of Alden Identification and Microscopic Wood ID Services, a wood science specialist and DNA expert out of Maryland with over 30 years experience in, in identifying wood species. And we supplied him at first with 11 samples from the Covington era up to this point. 
And every sample we've tested was pure maple, no other species. But we're, you know, we're seeking samples, donations, anything to carry out a complete study. We want to get a range from 54 to like 79 or so. You know, the sample doesn't have to be larger than like two inches. So, you know, people could eventually contact me if they have anything they'd like to contribute to the cause or anything like that. Absolutely. I I mean, that's a call to action. If you have that stuff, get in touch and we'll have Anthony's info in the description. Yeah, please send him some send him your, you know, old broken shells. Definitely. I've I've had a few donations and they're they're greatly appreciated. Uh, You know, this is an ongoing study that may never be finished. All the dots may never be connected, but I'll always be working on gathering more information to add. And hopefully it contributes to whoever picks up the reins after us, you know, yep. but these shells that we have studies for all of them, Covington shells were all maple, all hard maple with the exception of one early one had an inner ply of soft maple. Um, but all Acer species, North American maple. And I think I, I sent you some of, uh, some of our our study results, man. I just got to say, you guys are awesome. The fact that you're doing this, <laughs> the the Rogers, there's always something special about the Rogers community. I mean, to be doing this is just so like awesome to be having DNA tests <laughs> or, or, or like species tests, I should say, with like a DNA expert. It's totally. like, very cool. It's some geek out stuff and it's a labor of yeah. love. And I'm sure there's people who think it's ridiculous, but I love it. I just want answers. I think it's awesome. I want to piece the puzzle together, you know, because hopefully somewhere down the road, somebody might want to pick it up. And there's all this info, almost like like Dave Sims had all that info for Rob Cook. You know, we have all this info. Yeah. Somebody else might want to pick it up down the road, you know. So totally for the record, I believe that all Covington era shells are pure maple or at the very least, as long as Henry Grossman and Joe Thompson were in power. Um, to quickly address the claims of the use of birch for years, I've read the claim and before I knew better, I was regurgitating the claim of alternating plies of maple and birch in the Rogers world. We've seen it and heard it a thousand times. Anytime anyone asks, what's the composition of my shells, the shells that I have, this gets thrown around as if it's fact, alternating plies of maple and birch every single time we haven't found any trace of birch yet. It, gra- wow. Granted, we have not gone deep into the CBS era shells just yet, and our sample size will expand. But I think it's time that this alternating plies of maple and birch thing gets put to bed. Because whether birch was used at one point or not, that specific theory is is completely untrue. So mm. I think that it's, it, there you go. it's, it's time to put yeah. that thing that keeps getting regurg- regurgitated to bed. Um, well, something gets said in a forum and then it spreads and then it gets over and over and then you it becomes fact. But you're I mean, there is literally like documentation that says it's maple. Right. I've had I've had some long and interesting conversations with a longtime drum builder named Nicholas Chillenstam from Sweden. And he, he actually said that Rob Cook told him to get in touch with me, which is crazy. Uh, but <laughs> he has some interesting information and an interesting take on Rogers shells, CBS era specific, specifically. Um, he said that he's worked on and restored literally hundreds of Rogers drums and has never found a trace of birch. And he was telling me that birch found in the U S is far too soft to use in drum shells and claims that birch used in shells is often sourced from Sweden, Finland, and Baltic regions. I don't know if this is fact, but he stands strong on his claim. And, Mm. but this kind of, to me, battles the common claims of CBS implementing birch to cut costs because where U.S. birch is indeed cheaper than maple, to import Baltic birch, which is most most equipped for use in drum shells, according to Nicholas, I would assume that would be far more expensive if you're, you know, considering yeah. cost as a factor, you know. But Nicholas doesn't think we'll find any birch in these shells, but I have many claim that we will, and we'll see as the study continues. Um, yeah, Nicholas was part of the fun. Yeah, part of the fun. You know, I like the the conflicting, you know. The, the conflict between who thinks this and that. Um, yeah. But Nicholas was telling me that the only wood we'll find in the big four American companies will be maple, mahogany, poplar, and gum, and that we're not going to find birch. Um, when I reached out on a few vintage drum forums, asking anyone if they had samples to no- donate to our research, I had a couple guys contact me claiming to have restored multiple CBS era drums, which had a birch outer ply. And they sent me some photos of what they were talking about, but I'm no wood grain expert. So I actually sent these to Nicholas, to Bernie Stone, and to my friend and wood expert, Don Arell. And you have that photo of, it's a stripped floor tom, and you see the, the, the outer ply of wood. And when I showed them these photos, Nicholas said it was maple, and Bernie and Don both said birch. 
So even ex mm. experts can disagree over a photo. <laughs> And that, yeah. and that's why, to me, this DNA testing needs to continue. And hopefully we can get one of those drums to test and get to the bottom of some of this stuff. Um, Man, that really does put in, put it into perspective because all of those guys, and I was, I've known Bernie and I was lucky enough to meet Don at the show. And awesome guys. Nice guy. Hello to Don. But like, if you, they, if those guys can look at something and say conflicting things, then totally it. It's it's hard. Totally. It's hard to tell. That's why we need this DNA testing to to continue. Like a couple of weeks ago at yeah. the, at that Covington show, um, myself and Bernie Stone were looking at this CBS era Dayton shell that Gary Spaulding had donated to our research. The shell had been just crushed in a car accident, and Bernie was kind of ripping through it and looking through the plies, and he said that all he saw on this particular shell was maple. But we'll see. You know, I trust Bernie's yeah. eye. He's a brilliant guy. So I trust no, DNA eye. testing can't be. I mean, you're you're like the Maury Povich of uh, drum, <laughs> the drum world where you are. It is maple and people fall back in their chair. Right. right. <laughs> oh, that's a great. Um, yeah. So as we move on from shells, maybe we can dis discuss what else made these drums stand out from competitors. And the first thing I think of is Swivomatic. Uh, totally. The name eventually became a moniker for all things of the era, like bass drum pedals and strainers and everything. But it originated as a ball and socket holder made of machine steel consisting of three pieces. The ball and socket cage, which is, which is this piece here. Um, the cylindrical base attached to a dependent post, which is this. And the ball and mounting post with equatorial recess. And the equatorial recess is kind of this little inset piece that goes around the ball and then you know fully equipped of course it looks like this ben strauss claims that joe thompson improved on the long existing ball and socket joint by making the ball slightly egg-shaped to secure a lock and you have a pretty cool video of of ben talking about that exact topic so there's nothing new really about a ball and socket that's been around for centuries so joe came up uh with an idea that Ball and socket would be fine if we could get it to hold. When you wanted something to really hold, it had to have enough resistance that it wouldn't let go. So Joe came up with the idea of making the ball egg-shaped. You put a round against a round, nothing will ever hold. It just won't hold, because we found that out in all kinds of holders. You have round against round, eventually it works itself loose. So by building this egg shape and putting these tension, little tension screws slightly above center, it pushed the ball down into a pocket. The minute you put the two set screws on it, it pushed it against the wall and into a pocket. No way could you move it. And, and I want to say before we... Before we get back into this, this was one of my favorite parts of your presentation uh, was just because of how famous Swivomatic is. And mm -hmm. you got a room full of guys drooling over, you know, they everyone loves Swivomatic. And then but it's this information about the little bit of an egg shape. Yeah, it's just kind of blowing everyone's mind. Yeah. It's so cool. It blew my yeah. mind. It had me taking these things apart and being like, is this thing F shape? I mean, I had a micrometer out and was looking, yeah. you know, trying to like, yeah, because it's very slight if it is egg shape. Yeah. To describe for people who are, you know, not, not watching a video, it's not like this thing looks like, uh, like it's like one side's pointier like an egg. It's very, very minor. Very slight. Tell. But like Ben yeah. described in, in the video, you, you need something egg-shaped to secure a lock. And yeah. um, the design calls for two adjacent set screws to push the ball into the opposite side of the socket. So often I see people using more screws than they need and eventually damaging the ball because the ball is made of a softer metal than the set screws. And if I mm. could uh, pull up the actual patent here, uh, in section 45, the patent reads, the two screws are positioned 90 degrees apart and act to push the ball against the side of the cage opposite them, which reacts as a third contact point so that a third screw is not needed. And then in section 55, the ball being made of softer metal than the lock screws can be penetrated by the hardened points of the screws, thereby assuring retention of the ball 
at the desired position under the most severe condition of vibration and shock. Because it's a tom mount, and this is revolutionary. This right. is why everyone was, even Ludwig players, Slinger and the players, people were like switching all of their hardware over to Swivomatic For because sure. it was so incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see it on on all these guys' sets. You see it on Ringo's set and John Bonham's yep. set on Keith yep. Moon's. Uh, the list goes on and on. And um, you have a, a video of Ben Strauss talking about the set screws. We tried to be, again, tried to be everything to everybody. We couldn't be. So we figured here we'd make it for a left, for a right-handed drummer. And if he wanted to, if he's a lefty, he could turn it around. So we put four holes in there. The biggest mistake we ever made. People would call up and say, "Hey, you shorted me two screws." Uh -huh. And I'd say, no, we didn't. Yes, you did. There's four holes in there. I only got two screws. I said, but you couldn't even get into the other two. I tell you, the reason for that is if you turn it around, you take these two screws and put it there. It wasn't necessary. We should have never put it in. You know, you don't always do everything right here. What, what Ben's discussing there are, are these four holes in the Covington era unit. Two set screws, four holes. The four holes were simply for player options. And in an era full of rail consulates uh, and very few options, Swivomatic completely changed the game, not only then, but to this very day, just about how versatile and interchangeable it was. That's what's great about Swivomatic. Everything is just like completely interchangeable. In, in addition to the ball and socket pieces were the corresponding plates. Uh, first, the collet plate that accepts the hex rod, uh, which offered multiple angles depending on where it was mounted on the drum. And the original collet plates were designed for the corners of the hex to fit in these segment grooves of the fingers. I sent a diagram to you that from the catalog. And the last catalog to show this diagram was the 60R catalog, which suggests that at some point in the very early 60s, probably due to human error or most misunderstanding how to use it, the design changed to the version that most of us know today where the corners of the hex fit between the fingers and that diagram shows how they want the corners of the hex to fit in these little uh kind of carved out segment grooves like the side by side photo i sent where you could see i think i circled the segment grooves on the original on the left and then the photo of them in use holding the hex rod where you could see the corners of the hex on the left fitting in the segments and on the right fitting in the gaps of the fingers Again, yeah. again, a tiny bit of over engineering, possibly. Yeah, but it's smart. And and again, to describe for people who are just listening, it's basically the, the hex rod that would be the actual tom mount itself going into the the receiving unit on the actual bass drum itself. The slots of where, you know, it's like anything old where it was it would it would fit. It wouldn't be a 360. You could move it. And it right. would tighten it. It would fit into slots that would in certain eras and in certain iterations, they have different amounts of uh where you, it, it, they work differently where you put them right to kind of like it, it was roughly described it that. was only fitting one way exactly the one with the segment grooves it wasn't going to fit the corners weren't going to fit in between the fingers so yes um so the other plate would be the knobby plate uh most commonly used to on to on floor toms to mount legs or accessories off the floor tom it's one of those that almost looks like a doorknob kind of thing according to ben strauss it wasn't until buddy rich showed his dislike for the hex rod and collet plate symbol arm that the knobby plate became an L arm holder on the bass drum. And because of this, the headliner and celebrity outfits were born. I'd, I'd like to mention before you play the last video of, of Ben Strauss, that Rogers was the only company to base their outfit names off the plate configuration on the bass drum. It has nothing to do with the drum sizes or anything like that, where someone like Ludwig used things like the downbeat being 20, 12, 14, or the super classic 22, 13, 16. Roger's sets were named for the plate configuration. I sent you some mounting diagrams that are straight out of Jerry Shields inspection book from the factory that show exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, the plates designating the outfit and where those plates yeah. were placed there. They, you know, a name was given. Yeah. Fascinating. I never, that's information that I've never knew. You just think these, I guess you never really think uh, where the name, how, what the name corresponds to besides being, you know, it's a different year. It's a different upgrade. Right. But wow. That it's goes to the mounting hardware. Yeah. It's pretty cool. It's very specific. The names are based. So you could tell like what a swing time is compared to a headliner based on what 
plates are there and where they're mounted. Um, cool. So this video would be Ben Strauss talking about the knobby plate and how it became a symbol L arm holder and in turn created more outfits. Yeah, let's check it out. Now, when I got together with Buddy, he didn't like this symbol. See, it came out at an angle a little bit. Uh huh. Do you like it more straight up and down yeah. or something? Mm -hmm. so, so, what did we do? We took the, again, uh, I'll talk about interchanging. We took the knobby units from the floor tom tom and put them on a base joint and made a symbol over on them. See With a uh, bent arm or right. L shaped With arm? An L shaped mm -hmm. arm. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's the same unit. Awesome. Man, I just got to say, too, the videos of Ben Strauss and it's just kind of classic. Like if you're if you're listening, you're hearing and you can hear kind of his wife in the background yeah. talking and stuff <laughs> yeah. on some of them, which is funny. But we can all we've all experienced this. He's an older guy. I think it looks like the time code says like 1995. 95. Yeah. So um, he's he's but very clearly passionate about it. And, and, and that is just so cool to see and hear that. Right from his mouth. Right from his mouth, to, from a guy who was there from the beginning, you know? And all these videos of Ben should give you an idea of just how important he was to this company in the formative years and beyond, you know? Yeah. There's a story yeah. that Bob Kurtner, one of the managers at Covington, tells of Ben Strauss discovering some drums shipped from Covington to the Cleveland headquarters that weren't packed properly. He took those boxes to Covington, gathered all the employees around, took the box over his head and slammed it on the ground opened up to find a damaged drum. Then he did the same thing with a box that was packed correctly to opened it up to find an undamaged drum. Bob Kirtner mm. said he raised hell about it to quote Bob Kirtner. <laughs> yeah. And then he quoted Ben saying, this is what we built the company on and we don't want to lose it because some clown decides to not put a piece of cardboard in there that's designed to protect this drum. That act is a representation of the expectation of quality and attention to detail that was going on over at the plant. And yeah, and and like Ben, there were so many others who worked in that town over at the factory. And like we said, they took so much pride out of these drums, these drums coming out of their small town. And I, I, if you'll allow me, I'd like to mention some of the names of those folks. Of um, course, please do. I'd like to mention Dan Davis, Marvin Thompson, John Harmon, Frank Walters, Othi Shields, Joyce Bayshore, Esther Martin, Don Martin, George Martin, Llewellyn Minnick. Ralph Johnson, Richard Studebaker, Carl Ashman, Daryl Chenoweth, Jerry Shields, Don Kennedy, Helen Ross, Bob Kurtner, Frank Seth, Bill Nicholas, Humpty Horlocker, Otho Wagner, on and on. Um, as you can see, as a lot of the last names in there, there was literally families yeah. working there. Relatives, cousins, yeah. husband, wives with their son. I think of these people every time I play my drums or take them apart to clean or do research. Um these people are what matters the most to me. And I feel it's important that they're mentioned and recognized and remembered, frankly, you know, the history, yeah. the connection, the fact that we still have some of them with us where we could hear firsthand, you know, what went on back in the golden era of Rogers drums. It's just important yeah. to me, you know? Yeah. And it's, it's, it's like, it just comes out of you like the, the, to your enthusiasm for this. And I think it's cool. Obviously, I, mean, I know you love multiple different brands and we all enjoy all that stuff, but to, to kind of hone in on Rogers, it is a special thing. Yeah. And, and at, at that, the, the presentation you did, the, the shields classic, the Rogers drum show to have like Rob cook there and be hanging out the guy who's putting on the Chicago drum show, mm -hmm. there's a special thing of this smaller kind of community yeah. based show about a specific brand where people really aren't selling things like you might get one or two things. Yeah. But for the most part, people are really just there to look and showcase their stuff. Um, yeah, it was just it's special. It, it's a special group. It's almost more of like an appreciation for the town, for the, the history and all that, you know? Yeah. And I yeah. wish I mean, obviously, we can't go over everything today and i wish we could but you know there's time constraints and but on on my youtube channel which is dedicated to the rogers covington era you'll find lots more topics like bass drum pedals stands tags catalogs drums lots of interviews with employees and things like that yeah you know what's your username let's let's uh, just well, so people know it, you could go just type in my name and rogers yeah. or there's those new like youtube handles 
Yeah, yeah. I'm not exactly sure how they work, but mine is <laughs> I'm not either. Mine is Rogers drum videos. Oh, perfect. So you guys, you could search yeah. that too. And yeah, and I'll put the link in there in the bottom in the description, and all that. Perfect. But, Thank um, you. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and I think it should be before, you know, I don't want to, we wouldn't forget, but Jerry Shields, I was lucky to meet him. Wonderful man. Uh, I think once or twice, but you guys got to know him a lot. And yeah. He meant a lot to the Rogers community just with his knowledge of what he did absolutely. With, with Rogers. He meant, yeah. he meant quite a bit to me. We got, we, we actually met online and talked online for a couple of years and then met in person finally at that 2019 show that I was talking about. And he just kind of like took me under his wing a little bit. And I and like would take all of my calls and answer all of my questions. And he sent me a lot of his files. Like I send you that stuff from his inspection book. And yeah. you know, losing him was tough. And he was he was a pillar of the Rogers community, and we all miss him terribly. And I like to mention that we just just like a month ago we lost Dan Davis as well, who was an employee. So yeah, yeah. And uh, I actually like to mention a few people that I haven't mentioned who are Covington experts. Uh, Please. First, there's Jeff Herman, who grew up in Covington. Um, and just insanely knowledgeable about this stuff. Uh, legendary collector Gary Nelson, who lives right here in New Jersey, who I have awesome access to, and uh, Bobby Chiasan uh, from Jollity Drum Farm. These are the guys that I go to when I'm just like trying to figure something out and want to pick their brains. These guys are just absolute legends and 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 experts and then we got the new breed like guys like luke Kondrich and vintage w vincent ward who i know you you know those guys yep. those are my homies yep. um yeah. you know so we're kind of like the new breed a little bit and you know of course like I, I don't claim to be an authority on any of this stuff i just love it and want to just continue to try to uncover clues that may be lost to history and it's it's well it's a passion it needs to be preserved yes Agreed, and, and totally. what you did I mean, again, I, I think the the presentation and I, I, I will put in a picture of it. I got a picture of you presenting to the group of like uh, it was just like very cool and you don't see it very often. I mean, a lot of times I feel like, you know, I have fun doing my podcast. But again, I'm not standing in front of a room of people presenting things. Mm -hmm. And it, it was you did a great job and sh should be very proud. And it takes guts. And I mean, you literally drove kind of halfway across the country and um and did it and, and it was awesome i was very very happy to be there and uh and witness it so um that was that it's a big move uh, i don't want to say it's a big move forward for the entire drum community but for the drum history to like it was very legitimate and i think that's what we need is like these like case studies and examining things and it's it was important really important to to do that well i appreciate you saying that man really do your, yeah. your words carry weight with me it was it was nerve-wracking to have like you there and rob cook there and bernie stone there and i'm sitting there and i'm about i'm about to present all this information that i have confidence in but there's these le kind of like legends <laughs> looking at me and i'm like do i want to do this right now <laughs> <laughs> everyone's ready to boo and just jump all over you no you were i, I think I love our community. We all do. But there's something special about the drum community where totally. everyone it was just again, just to describe it more people were like, you had shells that you were handing around where people are examining Bernie's going is this I think that's two plus yeah. and, and it's just like it was pretty cool. It's a to, special uh, to community, man. The, the drum yeah. community is just like it's a special thing, man. Awesome. Anthony, well, this is just like incredible man like i said it's been great to to meet you we've talked in the past and i've thoroughly enjoyed your youtube videos and stuff Thank but you. to get you on the show is like uh it, it had to happen for this specific one um so anthony is kind enough he's gonna hang out and i want to hear more we're gonna do a patreon bonus episode i want to hear more about the like species testing the dna of the wood and uh and and how that all works and like maybe what you send them mm -hmm. and and if if this was like if the guy who's getting it is like, what the hell are these guys talking about? <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> but we care. But um, and all that good stuff. So if you want to hear that and 75 or something, other bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast and you can um, hear them and, uh, and and enjoy them there. So, uh, Anthony, at the at the end here, is there anything we, we talked about your YouTube channel? Mm -hmm. put, the, put that in the description. Any other social media or anything you want to plug? Um. I think as far as the Roger stuff, just the just the YouTube is is plenty. I think, and there's the Facebook groups, Covington Drummers, mm -hmm. which is this this specific era, right. Rogers USA, Rogers Drums. Mm -hmm. You get your your daily. I love the morning. You know, good morning. The weather is this posts uh, from all the Rogers guys. Exactly. So, um, anyway, very cool, Anthony. Thank you for your time and your preparation for all this, and it's just been a blast. So. 
Uh, thanks for being here, man. Thank you, Bart. It's been an honor, man. I appreciate it.